Well, I'm here in Denmark where I've been lecturing to Siemens Gamesa on the future of wind. And we've been taking a 50-year view. Now, I'll tell you one of the things that's surprising and a bit depressing. $22 trillion has already been committed by oil, gas and coal companies to exploit ever more complicated reserves to dig out. You know, now, I mean, going down you know, several kilometres under the sea, uh, ultra-deep gas fields and so on. $22 trillion. That's committed, that's, that's going to happen, absolutely. And yet, if you look at spending on all green energy for the period from 2004 to 2019, the total global spend was only three. Three trillion in the past 15 years, compared to 22 trillion over the next 15 to 20 years on old fashioned fossil fuel extraction. Now, that's in addition to all the money they'll spend on the fields they've already developed. So what we're seeing is that uh, the, the, the scale of current renewable introduction is, is absolutely tiny compared to what it needs to be. Now, despite that, if you look at the graphs of, of solar and wind and so on, they look quite impressive. That is to say, the total amount of power inst installed, if you look at it, it's a nice graph going up like that. But if, underneath the graph, if you reanalyze that data, you find a different picture. If you look at the actual amount of new power generation introduced, you find that wind power goes up and down a bit. It's a relatively solid line. It's, it's not an exponential rise. So, despite all the rhetoric about decarbonisation of our world, the fact is that this is happening very slowly. Now, the irony is that we have all the technology to do it. Even if there was no further innovation in wind, uh, we would have the ability to transform uh, energy production on the face of the earth with a combination of wind and solar primarily. Uh, and that would be done simply by going to scale. And every time you double the volume of uh, wind power installed around the world, you reduce costs on average by about 16%. Uh, it, for, for solar, it's about 18%. Now, wind turbines are getting huge. I mean, they're already bigger than a 380 jet. And questions have to be asked about what the actual optimum level is. Now, these blades are aerospace technology. They're manufactured primarily out of fiberglass with a gel coat service. And they have uh, less and less moving parts uh, as the rotors are replaced by a, a direct generation um, rotor where you just have very big magnets uh, turning against other magnets, essentially at the right speed to produce your 50 cycles a second or 60 cycles a second of wind. Now, every single one of these uh, big towers has the power to, uh, with a single rotation, uh, to, to generate an, enough electricity for four homes for a year. So these are big, big outputs compared to solar where you have to uh, cover you know, acres and acres and acres to get a similar kind of, of, of power generation. The challenge, though, uh, with wind is location. If you map out the windiest parts of the world, uh, you're looking at the coastline of Denmark, which is why we're here. This is the mother of wind power globally. It, 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 this is the heartland of wind power because Denmark has so many uh, islands, so much coastline, and so much shallow water. It's absolutely ideal for offshore and offshore, uh, onshore wind. Um, the coastline of the UK, of Ireland, uh, Canada. Um, yes, these are all windy places. But if you map against where the world's greatest power consumption is, you find a different picture. Especially when you think of the world population today, 7.5 billion, rising to 11.5 billion by 2065. And the fact that 85% of all humanity today lives in emerging markets, they are all going to look at your patterns of power consumption for the future. And this kind of thing is going to generate tremendous pressure for um, a growth of power. <laughs> and, and, uh, and where it is is critically important. And that's why... Uh, we're going to see huge investment in supergrids, smart grids. These are grids which are ultra high voltage. They pass direct current from A to B. They don't move it backwards and forwards 50 times a second because when you do that, you get an electromagnetic smog. You get huge wastage into the atmosphere from these high voltage lines. Now, when you move current always in the same direction, you can do it with almost zero power loss for 5,000 or 6,000 kilometers. <laughs> I've sat in a meeting with, um, with the head of national grid from China, the head of the national grid from Russia, and China was planning to sign a contract to export nuclear power from Beijing to Moscow. Yes, that is the, the 
potential of these high voltage direct current grids. They also mean that you could power the whole of Europe from the Sahara Desert. It means that you can power the whole of the United States from uh, the Arizona Desert, just 40 kilometers by 80 kilometers wide of solar panels. Now, yes, of course, there are storage issues, but those will also be sorted not just by gigantic Elon Musk, Tesla type arrays uh, similar to the ones being built in Australia, uh, but uh, through uh, things like salt caverns to, uh, into which air can be compressed uh, during times when we've got too much of it. Uh, things like methylation, uh, creating methane gas out of power. Yes, we can do the same with ammonia, incidentally, which can be used as a power source as well. Um, all kinds of things are being done to, uh, to, uh, to find ways to store the extra power, to smooth these things out. But if you have lines going across the earth, they also go across time zones. And that means that you've got an area where the solar power at the moment because the sun is shining, which can drive power to an area that's in darkness, which needs the power at the moment. Um, you can have an area which has got a lot of wind today, powering an area where there's no wind today. So watch this space. Wind has a gigantic potential uh, and a huge role to play in the future. Wind and solar will dominate uh, truly sustainable power generation. That means probably about 40% at least of European Union power by 2050.